This conference will now be recorded. This is the uh, Tuesday, September 15, 2020 meeting of the uh, Davenport Public Library uh, Board of Trustees. And we're meeting at the Fairmont Branch Library in the courtroom. Um, this is a partial, partially electronic meeting and it's being held as such because of a fully in-person meeting is impossible or impractical due to concerns for the health and safety of board members, staff, and the public presented by COVID-19 and to follow the governor's proclamation directing social distancing. Um, a remind, another reminder, I guess, that the, this meeting is being recorded and uh, now to establish attendance of the meeting, um, we'll take a roll call. Um, Amanda Mata. Here. Thank you. Craig Cooper. Here. Judy Lance. Here. Sylvia Roba. Hey, Sylvia. Uh, Tom Engelman. Here. Uh, Maggie Bottom. Here. Thank you. Uh, Rich Hendricks. Valadika Shrakandi. And myself, Steve Evans. Okay, uh, oh, but uh, we'll also mention, I guess, for the record that uh, also joining us in the meeting are um, Laura Dennis, uh, president of the Friends of the Library, um, and Marion McGinnis, um, our council liaison to the Denver City Council and um, uh, library administration members Lexi Riley, Tracy Moore, and um, oh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Oh, Jennifer Williams. Sorry about that, Jennifer. Okay. So that should take care of the attendance. Um, I guess we'll ask it. Let's see. Um, there we go. Um, Okay, first item on the agenda, uh, the second item actually is the consent agenda. Uh, we entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Thank you. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing and seeing that, I'll call for the vote. Um, Amanda? Yes. Craig? Yes. Judy? Yes. Tom? Yes. Maggie? Yes. Malvika? She went green. Okay. Yeah, I can't hear you. It's up right there, so. That's your nod. So, okay, I'll be voting yes. And uh, my own vote is yes, motion carried. Uh, next item on the agenda is public with comments. Um, okay. Is uh, Kimberly Lou uh, has she joined the meeting? Kimberly Lou? Okay, um, I had spoken with um, Ms. Lou and she at the time anyway was interested in addressing the board and had some of information for the meeting, but did not hear back from my request as to whether or not she could see. So we'll carry on. Um, okay, um, also want to recognize that uh, Rich Hendricks has now joined the meeting. Joe. Joe. Joe, I'm sorry. Joe. It just passed. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Joe is here. Okay. Um, moving on then. Um, so exciting about the agendas, reports, and communications. Uh, first item there is um, for, uh, friends. Laura, do you have anything to report today? Hello. How's the um? Sound quality, everyone. Does this sound okay? Yes, good. No? Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can hear me I, apparently some other people may not. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but I think I heard you say that you can hear me. So I'll go ahead and get yeah. started with my brief update. Um, just uh, a couple of things. Um, it's been pretty quiet with the friends. Actually, we didn't make quorum last month, so we actually didn't even have a meeting. But um, Amy uh, so wonderfully shared earlier this week that um, the Jenkins Family Foundation has um, committed $18,000 to our capital campaign. So that's uh, wonderful news that I'm thrilled to share. And then, of course, um, we do have um, the approval of our plans on the City Council agenda coming up next week. Um, and then we just sent out uh, a letter to our supporters, basically kind of beginning the public phase of the capital campaign. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen that or will see that. That went out this week, um, just kind of explaining how we were doing a campaign and then, you know, how COVID hit. And we're still going to try and fundraise a little bit, but we're also adjusting our plans. It was really actually a beautifully written letter by Tracy. So that's about it for me for our um, friends updates. Kind of short and sweet today. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's something I could suggest is to uh, watch the minutes if you couldn't hear the report. I'm sorry, I couldn't, was that for me? I'm sorry, I'm just having a really hard time. It's very echoey. Uh, Steve, was that directed at me? Uh, no, I was just telling you uh, that there are a couple people um, on the call or on the uh, in the meeting who indicated they couldn't hear you. Um, and so uh, we can hear you here fine at, at uh, Fairmont, but I was just telling them that um, uh, having not been able to think of anything else, that they could watch the minutes of the meeting uh, for um, information about your report. Okay. Um, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, the next item uh, on the agenda for our committee reports, uh, finance, Tom, anything from finance? Um, I was just looking at the budget recap for the current year. Uh, we're 16% in the, into the year, and our city appropriation spending so far is 16%. Um, amazingly uh, good management. <laughs> uh, there were, I think, a couple of large expenses, but um, they're kind of annual things that don't necessarily occur every month so thank you tom um personnel Amanda? yep so um the board we just craig and i just sent out the surveys to the board for amy's evaluation this year um, we recently received back the staff and supervisor surveys which we provided to everyone as well um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to do uh, the evaluation in October, um, assuming everything has come in by then. We've had a personnel committee, committee has had an opportunity to talk and go through the materials further. Um, I did have a couple quick questions for you, Amy. Um, yep, uh, one is, I, this is a failure on my part. I meant to ask to see if you could provide us with another update just of how your progress on the goals. I know you provided one a couple months ago, but just in getting you know ready for the evaluation, if that's something, if um, if there has been further progress on some of those things, if you could just email that to me and Craig, and then we can disperse that to the board. Sure. Or you can send it to everyone as a whole, that's fine. Um, just so everyone has that information, if they have questions on where you're at. Um, and another thing I had a question on was, in looking through the staff and supervisor reviews, there was some talk about like, who's required to wear masks where in the library and I just personally had a question on that um is are all are all the workers required to wear masks at all times or is it based on where they are in the library or so staff are required to wear them if they're um, working on the public floor if you're if you're not working on the public floor we have strongly requested encouraged that if you're moving through a like a hallway area, a shared area, um, stairwells, those kinds of things, 
that you wear a face covering. But when seated at individual desks, when people are working behind the scenes, they're not required. Okay. Um, okay. And then as far as the patrons, they're not required to wear them when they come in? They're not. We request, and we're working on our signage to make that a little more forceful, um, but they're not required. Um, and is that because that's what the city is generally doing, or is that something that we could revisit if it becomes an issue where staff is really complaining about feeling unsafe? Yeah, so that's a um, that's partly the city hasn't required in any public buildings, and also recommendations from the state library um, because of how politicized that has come, and because some employees of other service agencies have found themselves at physical risk when they've asked people or said that they're required. Um, so that's um, why we made that decision. Okay. Um, and then I had a different question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think my understanding is the governor has not required masks. So here in Wisconsin, you wear them everywhere. Um, I'm at home now, but um, they're required. They're mandatory if you enter a building. But I don't think the Iowa governor has done that. If I could speak to the, the issue with the city. Um, one of the reasons why the city has not, and this is not a defense of it, I wear a mask everywhere I go. And if I have a meeting, I say, you will wear a mask if you're coming to a meeting, whether it's a city meeting or not, that if I call a meeting, um, because I, that's just what I do. But um, uh, one of the issues with uh, in Iowa is because there were cities that were requiring people and that was found not to hold up. So there's a there's a court issue with um, cities were not successful at requiring that of people. So as long as it's not happening at our state level, it can't really be required um, officially in you know in at lower levels of government. So that's the issue, and that's always been the issue. If the governor had said you must wear a mask, the city would have complied. They she did not, and so we have not. So I don't know where that leaves the library though. But that's the, I don't know if because you're not part of the, I mean, you are part of the city, but you're not part of the city. Maybe you have some options. I don't know, but, or if you want to make them, but that's kind of the background from the city. So if it comes down from the state, I, the city would, I, I believe the city would immediately comply. So uh, I, I think that I you know, I would be in favor of it, certainly, and have been, and so have many others for a very long time, but it says. Thanks, Marion. That makes sense. Um, so, in, since the staff has come back in June, have there been a lot of complaints about how masks are being handled by patrons or by other workers? I'm just trying to get a feel for the level of ease or an unease that staff has had since coming back with the pandemic? Um, I think it's kind of all over the map. Um, some, some staff um, really don't want to be wearing masks at all. And um, some want us to have everybody 100% of the time. So it's, it's really kind of, um, across the, you know, like the, across the country. Like the general population. population. <laughs> yeah, and that's so, reflective of the entire state. Yeah. The country. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're trying really hard to, um, and have pulled supervisors, you know, measure your work areas again, make sure that, that staff are not in what's defined by the CDC as close contact. Um, you know, whether or not they have face coverings on, we, we, you know, if we have a situation where a staff member tests positive, we want to be able to say, you know what, but that person hasn't been in close contact with anyone at work because our work areas are far enough apart and, um, and, they, they, and they just haven't been, they haven't been in a situation where they've been in contact with someone less than six feet for more than 15 minutes. So um, that that's really what we're trying to, to do um, and really putting emphasis on. Um, 
but like I said, we're we're encouraging people to you know wear face coverings when they're walking through common areas in particular because you never know is is there going to be somebody going down the stairwell while you're going up it all those kinds of things. So um, I'm trying and to just balance that out. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's not fun. Like we said, it's the whole population <laughs> that's going through the same argument and debate all the time and without a clear directive um, or mandate from the governor, I don't, I'm sure it's difficult to navigate that. Um, uh, so just a couple more with COVID, I've said a few more to work through. Um, so with regards to the COVID policies that they have right now for staff and just for generally what's happening with patrons coming in and how long they're allowed to stay, are there updates that are going out to the staff on any kind of like weekly or bi-weekly basis to let them kind of know how things are going to be progressing or if you have an idea for how things are progressing? I know it's not entirely clear all the time, but. Um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, weekly or what on a, any particular schedule, but when there is a change and we're going to do something different or if, um, you know, there's, there's some need for clarification, we send that out on all staff email, but then on our intranet, there's a page that has all those policies assembled. And as soon as something goes out to all staff, Lexi updates that page so that there's one central place for staff to go to follow all of that. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, and then one other question I had based on the staff surveys was talking about like banned persons or persons who have had violent or aggressive behavior. What is the time period that they're banned or suspended from a person is once they've had some kind of violent or aggressive behavior at the library? Um, it's usually, if, I mean, if it's a, I mean, it just kind of it depends on the incident, clearly. So, but, you know, a, a violent or aggressive incident would generally move you probably right to a six month um, bar from the library. Um, we usually start with, you know, could you leave for the day, you know, could you leave for the week, and then go to a month, and then go to the next month, you know, kind of depending on what it is. Um, but for something that is, you know, violent, aggressive, um, especially if the police are called and charges are filed, um, that would be at least an immediate six months. Okay, I think that was all of my many, many questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda under committee reports is advocacy. Alvika, do you have anything to report? Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Malavika. Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's gonna try to reconnect. It looks like she might need to use the phone or take her headphones out, like if she disconnects them from the computer, maybe. She signed off. We're, we're hoping she's planning to yeah. sign back okay. in. Well, we'll, uh, we'll circle back at the appropriate time. In the meantime, let's uh, move on to the director's report. Okay. Um, so just, um, you know, a, kind of a minor update that um, at the um, budget kickoff meeting this morning for, for city staff, um, they shared that um, Union negotiations were likely started in early November, as opposed to late November, or early December. Um, then the after the recertification vote, assuming that um, the union does recertify, 
I would expect that they would. I think there's only been one public employee union in Iowa that has not recertified since um, all the changes um, were made in the law. So, Hi, this is Malvika. Hello. Hi. Welcome back. Hi, I, I am so sorry for the technical difficulty. The mic was working and it stopped, so my apologies. I won't interrupt. Just let me know, Steve, whenever, and I will jump in with the advocacy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, so at the, at the budget information session, um, the staff shared that uh, we won't be looking at um, any kind of a decrement um, or budget reduction for fiscal 22, um, at least not at this point. They've asked us to, to submit budgets that are um, basically flat, so um, so no increases, no no um, additions to staff or anything like that. But um, I think that all things considered, given um, potential COVID-19 impacts on city budgets, that I, I think that that's good news and speaks well to how the city finances have been managed um, most recently. Um, as Laura shared, um, the Jenkins Family Foundation. Um, Grant was a little more than $18,000. So kudos to Tracy for um, doing research and um, in Grant Station and actually finding that opportunity, which seemed kind of tailor made for us, and then successfully submitting that grant. Um, so the total that we've um, fundraised so far through the campaign is just over $833,000. So that's monies received and, and pledged as well. So um, some of the pledges are still out. The um, the air handler project is coming to a close. Um, Casey's been doing an awesome job kind of tracking that, and she probably knows more about air handlers and HVAC systems than she ever thought she wanted to know. <laughs> but they, they, started, they started one of them up yesterday, so they'll be working on, on finishing out and um, testing and balancing and things like that. Um, late September, early October, um, just in time for the end of the cooling season. Um, pretty much so, but then that also means that as that project comes to a close, we'll need to um, then finally come to a resolution regarding the water um, damage to the lower level carpets and um, some of the baseboard and things like that from um, when we had that incident with the, um, the sump pumps. So, and then um, the renovation project, like I said, so that will be going to um, be on the council agenda this cycle um, for approval of the, the bids. Um, to go out and then um, hopefully we'll have the bids back in time for um, the trustees to approve um, the contractor at the October meeting. Um, so it's a little bit of a tight timeline and so hopefully everything works out. Um, but if not, we can adjust and have a special meeting or, or something if we need to do that as well. So we would like to do that work November, December-ish and um, we would anticipate doing some work um, early. Um, restroom renovations can happen while we're still open. Um, things in the old Great Arts Academy space can happen while we're still open. But then ultimately when we start looking at carpet and really redoing um, that, um, the main floor of the library, we'll be looking at closing for four to six weeks um, so that they can kind of get that done all at once and we will get um, certainly better pricing from the contract instead of having to phase it so that we can somehow keep the, keep the doors open. So, so that's our plan on that. Um, any questions about anything else that was um, on there? And I should say the early voting sites, so that's still tentative. Um, we, we've told the auditor that we can do that, um, but we haven't gotten a firm commitment yet. So I think they're still trying to figure out how many early voting sites they need and where they should be located and things like that. So, but we have indicated that if um, if they would like to use those spaces, they're certainly available to them. All three permissions. Um, in Eastern and Huron. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, Marion, staying from the council. Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> Um, yeah, just a few updates. Um, uh, first of all, the census um, is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's kind of disappointing news. Um, the uh, follow-up enumeration, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty hot and blazing mad about this, um, the Iowa has the lowest 
follow-up enumeration in this country at 18.9 percent. Um, and um, so right now, Iowa has um, less than 90 percent in the 89.5 percent enumerated. Um, and of course, it was in the top five or six in self-response. But for some reason, it's been a terrible uh, follow-up uh, in terms of the enumeration, which I failed to understand. Um, and, and so it is actually the lowest in the country, and it has been that way. Uh, I track this every week for city council. Uh, there is a meeting, there's a call tomorrow, and I'm gonna be asking why the heck this is going on. Apparently, um, now there are people from Illinois that are coming over to Iowa to help with the self with the enumeration, the follow-up enumeration. But that's very disturbing to have less than 90%, and you're you know you're 15 days out from the end of this um, of this um, um, barn dance. So um, in any case, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna be asking tomorrow. But uh, we continue uh, to work the committee. Anything that you know the library can do. Uh, would be uh, anybody you know, any contacts you have, we need to get people enumerated. They can still self-report. Um, so, and the other thing, of course, is there is a lawsuit that uh, was filed uh, in August by some states and cities, um, including Illinois, but not Iowa, of course, um, I roll. Um, so, um, uh, it was filed and there is a, uh, an, a judge issued an order to uh, for the census to cease winding down its operations, uh, that will be in court thir this Thursday. So the idea is, you know, of course, it was supposed to end October 31st, then suddenly because the Senate didn't pass what they needed, to, didn't address what they needed to address, it got pushed back to September 30th. Um, and so, um, and so that's pretty disturbing. And that happened in late July. So uh, there is a, a national lawsuit. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Um, so there's a meeting, a phone call tomorrow. And then there is a um, this uh, lawsuit that's happening in this hearing in California on Thursday. So there may be some new, new news about that. Um, as Amy just mentioned, uh, and we've gotten been told this too, um, the city is in um, good financial shape. It's been very um, prudent in its expenditures, um, but but we are uh, the budgeting uh, going forward for next year. And of course, this is the fiscal year that starts July 1st next year. Um, we are going to be budgeting flat as a city, which means, you know, because that, there are increases that are built in. Uh, uh, but there's what they're what they're saying is I shouldn't say flat, but there's going to be no new projects. Um, it's going to be a very um, we're going to budget for a very uh, tight year. And again, we are in good shape right now uh, because of the prudence that we've tried to, to have. Um, so um, there are cities that are not in good shape, So, but we want to stay there. And we're not anticipating this is going to be a quick recovery. And that's why. So I know we're all looking forward to a time when we're not dealing with the things we're dealing with right now. Um, I did also want to mention that the... Um, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this at the last meeting or not, um, the Davenport Downtown Partnership is working on a, um, they have they have a, strategic, a new strategic plan for the downtown. Um, it might be um, just a suggestion uh, if this, if your board is interested in hearing about that to maybe involve, invite Kyle Carter, obviously the library to come and speak maybe at one of the meeting um the library is a you know a very important part of the downtown area and uh, it's an interesting strategic plan i was involved in it I, I sit on the downtown partnership as a liaison for that as well and so i was able to participate in strategic planning and it really looks at the at the um, downtown in a very interesting way as being almost like a series of neighborhoods um and not just uh you go from point a to point b um, but places where people can stop, uh, you know, destinations, looking at parts of downtown as, you know, being an arts district and the government district. So looking really at downtown is not a generic thing, but as having sort of personalities within the downtown. Um, and I, it, it's not a, this isn't rocket science, 
uh, but it's it's uh, which is good because sometimes with those plans you're like what this is I don't recognize this place and and it's not like that it's logical and it's it it makes a lot of sense so that may be something you'd be interested in hearing about since uh, downtown is and Kyle could do that very quickly I think um, so just a suggestion um, and then um, uh, um, just uh, Amy, I, I just uh, another suggestion it says I'm having a slow network connection, but um, as uh, I don't know if the uh, is city council have have you gone have we gone through the plans with city council of the re the rehab have we talked about that in detail or is it maybe time um, we have a lot of uh, things in our agenda coming up but is it maybe time for um, the library to come back and present maybe at a management update meeting. Um, I can't remember if you've talked about the renovations or not. Um, we did, but I, okay. and I, I can't remember how long ago it was that we showed the rendering right. and, and talked about some of that. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a, a brief thing, a brief update. It's, you know, people always love hearing from the library because uh, you do interesting things. Um, so uh, maybe a brief update about that, um, maybe something um, I can see uh, we're pretty booked I know in October, um, but I can ask about trying to get that on maybe a management update meeting if that's something you're interested in. Why don't you let me know that, okay? okay. Um, so, all right. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the, um, the um, King's Harvest Shelter, uh, the winter overflow shelter as it's known. Uh, will not be at King's Harvest, um, and this may have an impact on, um, you know, people who are um, experiencing homelessness. Um, this may have an impact on the, the number of people who are in the downtown area this winter. Um, the um, Humility of Mary, Salvation Army, uh, Family Resources, and different organizations that work with this will, will again be housing people in um, hotels. Um, they're looking for funding for that, obviously, and there is some money coming from uh, different areas from the city uh, to the CARES Act for some FEMA money to help with this. Um, this is the model that um, they went to at when COVID hit last year, and this is what they will continue to do. And long term, um, it may be that um, this may be um, the kind of route that they take. So that may that may impact um, the populations you're experiencing at the downtown branch and i just wanted to let you know about that um, um that was um we've been having conversations with um most recently with humility of mary and they confirmed you know that is the way they're going and it it isn't safe right now in, in any case to to have congregant populations because of covid so um it's it has been initially driven by covid but probably a direction um the community of Mary will tell um, you that anybody who listens that shelter is shelters are not ultimately the the best way of dealing with um, people who are experiencing issues with um, homelessness. Um, so um, there are better alternatives, and it's not a it's not a, a good long term strategy uh, to depend on shelters. So they're moving toward a model that doesn't. Um, so in any case. Um, that's everything I have today. If anybody has any questions for me, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. I do have a question. Going back to the census, uh, I received four or five requests for the census the first couple of weeks. I sent out the first one. I've had two people come to my door now yes. following up. Are we supposed to be talking or, or is there a way to track that my census went through? Um, you should. Did you do your census online initially? I think so, yes. Okay, then you probably got, I, I, I have had the same experience. There's a reason for mine. Uh, our house was six apartments in 2010. And so I have people that keep coming back looking for apartments that don't exist. It's a little bit frustrating. You know, I kind of want to say, why aren't you out getting these other people? Of course, the census takers are just sent places. Um, you can, I have called, um, we had the same issue at our apartment building that my husband and I own. I have called. So if you, if you get a sheet at your house, follow up and call the census and explain, um, are they explaining why they're coming back to your house? Uh, no, 
I mean, there was a note saying I was here, da, 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 da. Okay, and if you get a note person, like that, it says call within two days, so you should call. And that will resolve it. That will typically resolve it. Um, okay. uh, it may be your house was vacant or something like that, uh, had a different function. And so, um, and so you should call, um, you know, call the follow up. It says call the number. And, and even if it's been more than two days, call them and say, okay, I'm, I've got this. Here's the number. There's usually a number. Um, and then you can get it resolved. It's often because things were vacant or a different thing. I don't know how to explain. I don't know how I haven't on my apartment building. I called and I went through every single four apartments and we all did a vacancy thing with that. So that was easy because it's vacant. I can't get the census to understand. There are not six apartments in my house and I can't make them vacant because then that would be six vacancies that don't exist. You know what I mean? So I don't want to do that. So um, in any case, a call, do what the paper says. It says, it says, do your census or call. And you and I have, when I've called, have gotten through very quickly. I don't sit on the line very long. So okay. I, that's my recommendation, okay? Okay, thank you, Marion. Any questions mm -hmm. for Marion? No, Ma I, uh, Steve, this is Malavika. Yes. Uh, Steve, uh, Marion, I just wanted to let you know that I got some census flyers from Shelby and I've distributed it to the professors here and especially my colleagues who are teaching information literacy to students in the library. And they have been talking about census uh, to their students and checking whether mm -hmm. they have, uh, you know, filled, I mean, their families or they have filled. That is one. And then we spoke to the International Students Department again about the census. So Shelby was very kind in giving me uh, quite a few materials, which we have passed on. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, and that's uh, the St. Ambrose, right? Okay. Thank you. Yes, that's St. Ambrose. Okay. Thank you. Very Thank good. you, Marion. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, which is new business, I wanted to just circle back and check if, to see if perhaps Kimberly Liu has joined the meeting. Doesn't appear so, but just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is new business. Uh, first item under new business is discussion of the library sex offender policy. Amy? Sure. So, um, this is um, really not changed. The law hasn't changed. Um, this policy went into effect when there was a change in Iowa law that prohibited um, sex offenders who had whose offense was against a juvenile um, from um, being in public libraries or lawyers on, on, on the grounds of a public library. So that's when, um, and when this um, policy was put in place. Um, again, the law hasn't changed. So I would say we're really not looking for any changes on that. Um, though um, Casey suggested that these good ideas, so um, we put um, some links in to those specific code sections that are underlined. Um, so when it's online, if people are looking for that, they can find it really easily. I think those links are a very good addition. It's helpful sometimes to be able to see just what the law says. Um, any questions for Amy or any just discussion of the, any other discussion of the policy? Uh, Steve? Yes. This is Malavika. I just wanted to mention, Amy, uh, thank you very much for those. I mean, within the within the sex offender policy, I do see the new inclusions, which are in red, uh, the chapter numbers and the subsection numbers. I went into those to see them, and this was good that we included these detailed uh, 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 items within it. Uh, I, and I, I see that they are as PDFs on the website, the Iowa State Legislative website. I just had a request, if it's possible, and if it's easy, uh, I don't want any inconvenience for anybody, but if it's easy, is there a possibility that we can hyperlink those chapters in the policy? when we make it online? I guess I'm not understanding the question because I, I think there are there are now hyperlinks to those sections. So I, I'm, I'm missing something. Just the first one. No, no. The first one? Oh, the yeah. individual yeah. sections? Yeah, once you put No, no. No, I mean, 
I, I'm so I'm sorry, Amy. I couldn't I I couldn't hear you well. I'm sorry. I, I think I misunderstood. I think that. Um, so. No, no, I no. There, there there are hyperlinks. I I also went on our library's website and I was seeing the current policy, and then I saw that these these are newly included next to it on 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 uh, in this in in the policy update uh, that we got through email. So I was wondering when we update the website after we approve this, is it possible that we could have the same on the website as well, the hyperlink? Yes, yes, we would plan to do that, yes. Thank you, Thank. that was my question. Thank you, oh, Amy, okay. thank okay. you. Thank you. And, and if, if anybody is curious, um, to my knowledge, um, there has never been an, um, permission given for somebody you know in this situation to use the library other than under very one time only kind of restricted conditions so um, so they are still um, allowed by law um, to use library services so um, we will set up appointments with our customer services supervisor for somebody to come in and fill out an application, get their library card and leave, and then they need to designate somebody who would pick up their holds or things like that, or can use electronic resources. Um, so for those kinds of things, um, we might make a, a one-time um, exemption, but by and large, that permission has never been given. So. Thank you, Amy. Okay, next item on the agenda under new business is board training. And the topic for today is laboring of laboring, labeling of library materials. So I asked Lexi if she would put something together when for this when we did the um, the update of the selection policy, um, we cited um, some of those ALA um, documents and there was some interest in the board and just hearing a little bit more than that. So Lexi, take it away. We can't hear you, Lexi. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, I am also going to share my screen so that you can see some slides that I have put together. Um, can you see those slides? No. No. Oh, yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about labeling library materials. So, primarily looking at the call numbers that we use and other ways that we um, typically label our items, uh, the types of labels that we are able to use, and um, requests that we occasionally get that we are not able to meet um, because of the types of labels that we do not use. So, I'll take you through some examples. Um, so when we are labeling items, we are looking for um, viewpoint neutral directional items. So um, what we're trying to do is organize our resources by call number in a way that will help our patrons locate general subject areas um, or specific genres, specific item types in a way that's going to save them time and make it easier for them to access the information that they are looking for, um, while making sure that we are not trying to persuade a patron to a particular point of view. So again, viewpoint neutral. So some examples of that that we use in our libraries are going to be things like fiction and the different fiction genres like mystery, romance, science fiction, um, urban fiction, horror, um, different material types like graphic novels, DVD, um, audiobook, um, Dewey Decimal Numbers for our nonfiction collection. But again, we can find um, the content that we're looking for. Um, and then having very broad age ranges for uh, juvenile materials or young adult materials, which in their call numbers you would see designated with J for juvenile or um, YA for young adult. Um, and we keep those very broad um, so that we can direct patrons to the area of the library they need to go to without prescribing um, very specific things like grade levels or reading levels. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so again, these are all viewpoint neutral. They're not saying that, you know, there's preference towards one genre or another. Um, and, you know, with a lot of items, it's not always 
100% guarantees what genre an item should be in. So James Patterson, um, his books are, you know, fiction, but they're also kind of mystery or suspense. And sometimes he writes um, books with like a romantic element to them, and sometimes he doesn't. So, um, you know, we do the best we can at identifying the genre that it belongs in. But again, we're identifying um, the genre of the item and um, not giving preference where um, like uh, any particular viewpoints. So um, there are different types of labels that we are not able to use, which are referred to as prejudicial labels. So those are going to be labels that are trying to persuade patrons toward a certain viewpoint or establish a preference for something. Um, they could also be labels that restrict access to uh, materials based on um, their content, their languages, their themes. Um, restricting those based on their label um, to keep a particular group or, um, you know, group of patrons um, away from those materials. Those are labels that we are not going to use. Um, and some of those directional um, aids can be prejudicial labels if you are using them in that way to, like, restrict access to a certain group. So um, if we were labeling a section young adults and then um, said 10-year-olds are not allowed to go over to um, the section that's marked young adult, um, that would be restricting access. And so that is not how we would use that type of label. Um, so some examples that um, we are occasionally asked about that would fit under that criteria. Um, sometimes we are asked at the desk, you know, where is your Christian fiction? Can you point me towards your Christian fiction section? Um, and we do not currently have a Christian fiction section or uh, what some libraries would call an inspirational fiction section. Um, and we do not have that section because singling out that one particular religious faith uh, would communicate that religious faith when we don't also have um, a section of Jewish fiction or um, Muslim fiction. Um, so that would be kind of singling out one group above others and um, in that way indicating a preference. Um, like I said, some libraries uh, would, you know, do something like calling it inspirational fiction, um, but we haven't found that label to be very useful because inspirational is a pretty nebulous term, you know, what is inspirational to one person is not necessarily what is inspirational to another person. So, um, you know, at that point, the meaning of the label becomes kind of muddled and you're not really sure what you're going to find over there. And we want it to just be essentially a Christian fiction section with a different name. So um, that being said, though, we can still provide readers advisory services on these types of subjects. So when a patron comes up to the desk and says, where can I find um, Christian fiction? Uh, we would let them know, you know, we don't have a separate section of Christian fiction, but let me see if I can put together a reading list of items that would interest you. And then we would go about conducting our normal reference interview where we ask the patron some questions about, um, you know, what they're interested in reading so that we can point them in the right direction, whether it's, you know, something with romance or something without romance or um, get them the books that they need. And our librarians have all been trained to use a variety of readers advisory tools so that they can um, conduct that reference interview and put together a list of available items for that patron that will meet their needs. Um, rating systems, um, we get asked about um, those in regards to some of our audiovisual materials on occasion. So um, a patron might say, oh, I'm looking for some family friendly movies. So can you point me towards uh, where you shelf your um, G rated or PG rated movies? Um, or, you know, do you have things labeled, um, you know, showing which items you have that are, you know, violent or you have, you know, particular adult content in it that I want to stay away from. Um, and so we don't use those either. Um, so private organizations like the MPAA for movies or the ESRB for video games, for example, have their own rating systems that they have come up with for those types of um, media content um, that are you know, subjective in nature and the criteria does not stay the same all the time. It is kind of fluid and ever changing depending on um, you know, societal 
um, references. So for this reason, labeling items by saying this is where all of our G-rated movies are, this is where our PG-rated movies are, um, would be a violation of the Library Bill of Rights um, because, again, it's subjective um, and it's not viewpoint neutral. So um, again, again um, try to work with the patron to ascertain what sort of movies they're looking for, what sort of video games they're looking for, ask them questions, and use our resources to come up with some suggestions that might fit their needs. Um, but we don't single those items out. Uh, another one we're asked about on occasion is um, books that are separated by their grade level or their reading level. Um, so, for example, a um, parent might come in and say, oh, I need um, some books for my child. They read at this lexile level or I'm looking for them with this many, uh, this big, this high of an AR score. Or um, my five-year-old is just starting to read and I would like to see all of the level one readers. Um, so we don't organize the books in the children's section in this format either for a few different reasons. Um, with the readers, one of the reasons we don't do that is because the levels that are used are subjective. So if I looked at the level one books of one publisher um, and then compared them to the level one books of a different publisher, they would not look exactly the same. They have different standards and criteria they're using to decide on those levels. Um, so we always tell parents that, um, you know, you can usually see the level on the item. It'll usually, um, the publisher has already placed it on the spine. We just don't group them all together like that. So that way, parents can make the choice to look through the spines of the items and pull out the different level ones. Um, but we encourage them to flip through them and um, try to get a sense of if that meets their child's needs despite what it's labeled with. Um, the movies and the video games are the same, by the way. I think I forgot to mention. They do um, you know, come from the distributors with their ratings um, on the cases. That's just how they're produced. And so we are not able to alter those. So if a patron came in and pulled a movie out, they would still be able to see what the rating is. Um, for grade levels and reading levels, there are also some psychological barriers that um, can be created by grouping them by those reading levels. So, um, you know, if a child comes in and they're looking for some books to read and they see that, oh, here's a book I was really interested in, but, you know, it says it's over here with the really advanced readers or it's got a really high left file number and um, I really wish I could read it, but it, it sounds like it's going to be too hard for me. Um, that would discourage them from trying something a little outside of their zone or, um, you know, wouldn't give them the confidence that they, um, that they need to try something now. Um, and that also can create an issue with confidentiality, too. So if I am a kid and I have come to the library with one of my friends, and my friend is, you know, a really advanced reader, and I struggle with it a little bit more than... Um, when we are looking at books together, my friend is going to be over here looking in this section, and then, you know, I have to go over here and look in this other section, and now my friend knows that I'm really struggling with reading. And that's a psychological barrier, too, and it's kind of a breach of their confidentiality. We don't want patrons to feel like it's being broadcast to everyone what they're reading or, um, you know, what they're reading are. So, um, so for all those reasons, we have the items grouped, again, by, um, you know, J or YA, so that there's a particular direction they can go to in the building to find the items they need. Um, and based on uh, what type of material it is, so, you know, the picture books are together, um, the chapter books are together, that sort of thing. But within those, patrons can um, you know, have the freedom to browse and, um, you know, not be directed towards any particular place unless they are, um, you know, at the desk asking us for that sort of guidance. So um, we want to make sure that our collections are welcoming to everyone and are accessible to everyone um, in a way that um, they're right for our patrons as well. So um, that's all I have for you today. I did um, put some links in here to um, some of the position statements that the American Library Association has put together and um, some Q&As that go into a little more detail about some of these particular situations. Um, and I'm sure we'd be happy to send those out if anyone is interested in some further reading on the subject. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Lexi? Lexi, uh, this is this is Malavika. I just wanted to thank you very much. Uh, I I work as a cataloger, as you know.
So this is very dear to me. Uh, so thank you very much. And I would certainly like, uh, if you don't mind, sharing your resources. This is something I could share and talk to uh, uh, with some people here that have had some similar questions. So if it's okay with you and you do not mind sharing those resources. So thank you very much. It, it, it was excellent to know more. Thank you. Yes, I can certainly share. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, Lexi. Appreciate it. Steve, this is Judy. Um, my retirement's here. I'm leaving. Oh, okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Um, yes, just to note if uh, that wasn't picked up on the recording that Judy Lance has left me. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is old business. And uh, the one item there is approval of the 2018 to 2021 strategic plan. So I entertain a motion to approve the 2018 to 2021 strategic plan. So moved. Thank you, Joe. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the 2018 through 2021 strategic plan. Is there any discussion? Okay. If not, I'll open the vote. Craig? Yes. Tom? Yes. Maggie? Yes. Joe? Yes. Malavika? Yes. And my own vote is yes. The motion carried. I also vote yes. This is Amanda. Oh. <laughs> oh <sorry. laughs> the agenda covers your name. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sure. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. What are you? So, um, so, so just as a reminder, with the with the plan approved, then the next thing that um, we'll be bringing to the board would be the implementation plan, so the actual path that we'll be working on in um, calendar year 2021 plan. So you can expect to see that. I don't know. No, we December Decemberish. I would I would say. Uh, one last time, just to be sure, uh, Kimberly Lou joined the meeting. Okay. Steve, don't yes. you have to go back to under committee reports advocacy from Malavika? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> thank, oh thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, I just wanted to share that right now, uh, this is an initiative. It is called I Love Libraries. It's an initiative of American Library Association. And I would request whenever you have a moment, I'll send you I'll send you these links through email, all of you. Uh, do nominate a librarian. They will be selecting 10 librarians, and each librarian, after selection, of course, uh, would get a five thousand dollar cash uh, prize. And uh, this is a great honor, and they, all our librarians around are doing such a lot of great work. Uh, so if we can nominate our librarians, it would be absolutely fantastically excellent. So I'll send you all those links uh, through email. Uh, uh, and, and Steve, if I might redirect it to you about the sweet treat uh, share that you might want to do. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Okay, I was going to send out an email, but uh, if you think about this, I can get this together. Um, last, this past April, when uh, we were initially really wound up in the COVID-19 situation, even more than we are now, um, the Library Workers Week occurred, and um, because of the things that are going on, um, and also with several staff members not being at work. Um, we did not do anything as a board to, uh, to recognize them. In the past several years, we've uh, provided donuts. And so um, uh, Malawika has suggested um, that we do something now, which I think is a good idea, and that uh, she knows a baker who can 
uh, bake uh, cookies or cupcakes and individually wrap them so they would be um, in good shape for these times. And uh, so I just wanted to, and she's going to uh, get information about the pricing on that. And so if um, we could, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is, is uh, give that some thought. And if you could uh, uh, let me know um, if you think that's a good idea, which I hope you will, um, let me know. And uh, also, uh, like I said, we will uh, divide the cost up among board members and uh, share it in that form as we have in the past. So, um, uh, like I said, Malavika is going to find out about the cost of it and uh, let us know. Thank you, Steve. I, I, I will certainly I will certainly get an estimate and uh, get the designs and things like that. And uh, it would be excellent if we can do it. As Steve said, we always had donuts every year uh, during National Library Week. And uh, so I will get back to you, Steve, and then if you would like to share after I get the estimate. Is that OK? Yes, that'll be fine. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, okay, the only item left is uh, to adjourn the meeting. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to uh, adjourn the meeting. All those in favor, please say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Okay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it. Nice to see you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.